All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get underway. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. We are delighted to have you back at uh, Lubar at the Lubar Center at uh, Eckstein Hall at the law school here. Uh, today we are doing an event that is related to Marquette University's 2018 Mission Week. And the, the theme of Mission Week this week is truth to reconciliation, pathways to peace. There's a question mark after the word peace. Pretty important. Um, we're going to be talking with a, a couple of folks who are good enough to be spending uh, two days here at Marquette University, uh, lending their time and their expertise and talking about important matters, things that uh, we should all care about as citizens of this country. They are the authors of this book, Gather at the Table, The Healing Journey of a Daughter of Slavery and a Son of the Slave Trade. They are, to my left, Sharon Morgan and Tom DeWolf. Before we give them a nice uh, warm welcome to Marquette University Law School, let me tell you a little bit about each of our guests today. Uh, Sharon is a respected and noteworthy communications um, professional, writer, and genealogist. Uh, she is a recognized expert in multicultural marketing. She's had a client list with all the names that we would recognize, Walmart, Coca-Cola, uh, things like that. Um, she has spent uh, a remarkable uh, part of her life uh, living abroad. She's been in Jamaica, uh, South Africa, uh, actually started a restaurant in Paris, France. A successful one, I understand. <laughs> uh, so she's had quite the life, and she's also written a couple of other books. So we are delighted to have Sharon with us today. Seated next to her is Tom DeWolf. Tom is the executive director of the nonprofit organization Coming to the Table, which seeks to heal wounds from the uh, racism that is rooted in the United States history of slavery. Tom uh, travels to universities around the country, speaks at conferences, uh, talking about the subject of how the legacy of slavery very much affects contemporary America today. Uh, Tom also wrote a book uh, a number of years ago called Inheriting the Trade, and in that he uh, tells us about the astonishing discovery that his ancestors were very much a part of the slave trade in this country, one of the slave trading dynasties in America. So we're going to get into all of that and why they decided to write this book together about their journey of racial healing and reconciliation. Won't you please give a warm welcome to Sharon Morgan and Tom DeWolf. Thank you. So let's set the stage for the discussion today, and I think it's important to, to learn just a little bit more about the backgrounds of each of our guests. And I guess, Sharon, I'll begin with you. In the book, you, you talk about, I am the daughter of, uh, of slaves. I am the, the descendant of slaves. Tell us a little bit more about your family so that people have a sense of where you're coming from on this. My realization of that did not come until I was an adult. And I got really interested in genealogy when my son was born in 1969. And becoming a new mother, you, are in, you become really interested in your past and where you came from and who are my people and who are we. So my interest was piqued at that point and I started asking questions in my family. I grew up in a household with my grandparents, with my mother's mother and father. So they were readily accessible. My father's family, not so much. Mm -hmm. But I found out in the course of asking questions and talking to family members that there was this really old woman who lived in my, my father's father's house. And when I was a baby, when I was like three, she was over 100 years old. And my father finally revealed to me, you know she was a slave. And it was like, wow, that sure. was just shocking. That here's somebody who's alive. And of course, I couldn't talk to her because I was a baby. But it really was compelling. And it, that was the number one thing that sent me on this journey. And then I have been researching as best I can from wherever I've been in the world as much as I can. And at this point, I have learned a huge amount about my family. I've identified more than a dozen people who I can name by name, some of whom I even have pictures of, who were enslaved. And my next project is actually a book about, purely about my genealogy. And I'm going to live in Mississippi for a couple of years probably to write this book so I can walk in the footsteps of my ancestors. Tom, let's talk about your family. Uh, I, I described it as an astonishing discovery, but, but you figured out that the last name DeWolf 
uh, has a not-so-pleasant side to it. Uh, tell us about what you found out about your family. It was astonishing. Um, I used to own a combination restaurant and movie theater called Pat and Mike's in downtown Bend, Oregon. It was around the corner from the fire hall. And uh, one of the firemen, I became friends with several. One of them came up one day and said, I think we might be related. My dad's middle name is DeWolf. And um, that was true. And to keep this short, when my wife and I got married, we went and visited his father, who was a retired Episcopal priest, um, living at that time on Cape Cod. A parishioner had said, come stay at our place in the off season. And so Lindy and I went there, and he spent the evening telling me stories about um, the DeWolf family and how David and his son and I, the firemen, were sixth cousins once removed. He did all the genealogy and, uh, and then told me about these ancestors like, uh, you know, related to um, Ethel Barrymore, the great actress, was married into the DeWolf family. And um, Herman Melville was married to his aunt was a DeWolf. And uh, so in, uh, I, forget, I think it's chapter 42 or 45 in Moby Dick, you'll see Captain John DeWolf. Um, and uh, the guy who played Paul Drake on Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> William Hopper, middle name DeWolf. Um, the, uh, so hearing all, I, mean, I wrote Drew Barrymore constantly. And all I got back was autographed pictures. <laughs> got a great and collection leave me alone. of autographed yeah. pictures of Drew Barrymore. So, um, but learning about this history was, at that time, it was, you know, he described them as rum runners, slave traders, and privateers. And it sounded like the ride Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. Um, and so it wasn't until Dave got invited to um, go on this journey um, the, and he shared with me the invitation, and I contacted the woman who wrote it to collectively look at this history together, and that's when I got involved, <clears throat> was selected as one of ten. We ranged from siblings to seventh cousins. I was seventh cousins with everybody, um, and made this the documentary film Traces of the Trade, which was at Sundance and on PBS, and, um, and, and wrote my first book about learning this and then experiencing all this. I mean, I was in my 40s before I knew any of this family history. And this ancestor was one of, it was one of the slave trading dynasties, the, one of the largest. The. It was the. the. I mean, the nearest, the, there were like, this family was responsible for more than 100 slave trading voyages through the Triangle Trade. The next largest, I guess, conglomerate, whatever you would call it, was 30. 10,000 10, Africans. 10,000 10, people, 100 <coughs> journeys, and there was 30 journeys was the second largest slave trading dynasty in this country. This country was quite small in the slave trade. I don't know, 4%, 5% of the worldwide slave trade. It was, you know, Portugal and England, and, and you know, there were other countries that were much larger, and, you know, more than a third of enslaved people ended up in Brazil, just that country. And, and so this nation wasn't that large, but was particularly insidious in defining slavery by the color of one's skin. Um, so it was, it was I mean, the, 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 the most successful guy in the family, James DeWolf, ended up being a United States senator from Rhode Island and died the second richest man in the country um, the slave trade started him on his wealth, but he got so many ships. He had more ships in the War of 1812 than the U.S. Navy did. Mm -hmm. and, but they were privateers, so made their money that way. Let's talk a little bit about how the two of you met. De describe for us where that happened and, and how it happened. We met at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And we were attending, and now I'm not going to remember the name of it. Summer Peace Please. Building Institute? But no, we had a name for what we were doing for coming to the table, because it was the very beginning. We were looking at historical harm, and we were there to do a, a workshop. 
I think we it was calling coming to the table. The the workshop was okay. I think so. I was it's a, a long time ago. I was a, now it's been a long time ago. <laughs> I was. A, I'll say this. I was a very reluctant participant. They had to beg me to come, and they had to pay for my ticket because <laughs> it's like you want me to go where. <laughs> I had met the person who was organizing coming to the table online because of my genealogy work. And when she said that they were going to do this workshop, she's like, you really should come. And it's like, yeah, right, OK. No, she's like, you really should come. And I'm like, you want me to come to Harrisonburg, Virginia, to a place that I have never heard of, with white people that I do not know, and you really expect me to, do, to talk about slavery, and you really expect me to do that. And she's like, yes, and we'll, we'll take care of everything, just come. So after a lot of arm twisting, I agreed to go. And there were several people there. And Tom stood out. I was aware of his book. So I had, I had that. So I f actually felt a little bit of affinity about it. But I did not like the way he looked. I just didn't like him. <laughs> because I think that what I had read in the book Although it was provocative and heartrending and things like that, it's still like, this is Mr. Book version white guy with the blue eyes and the, you know. And he wrote, he took notes about everything. And that was really disturbing. And he was sitting right across from me like you. And he would just look up at me and, and then he'd be writing. And it was like, oh God, who, what is this? So it didn't get off to a great start. <laughs> but you ended up. But we ended, now we're friends. But it, that was, was not friends yet. And surely there was enough of a connection there that, that at some point you decided you were going to go on this journey and, and write a book about this. Well, his region. book. And when I got I, back in Chicago, I heard that he was coming to speak at the University of Chicago. And I said, well, you know, I really didn't treat this guy very well. It really was a good book. <laughs> so I went to the university, <clears throat> even though I had something else to do, mm -hmm. just to say hi. And you know, I really hope I didn't offend you too badly the last time we met. And that was okay. the beginning. And then we started having conversations. And apparently, it meant a lot to you, so. Well, we met in. Uh some months later in Jackson, Mississippi. In Mississippi, which is another <laughs> Which is a whole other thing. But we were there for a weekend retreat that was being um, coordinated through coming to the table. And was that the one that was storytelling focus and healing of? Anyway, it, genealogy or storytelling was all connected. Everything that we've done has all been connected. And, and I had thought that this topic would be something really good to write about, this coming to the table concept. But a white guy writing it on my own didn't make any sense at all, because um, coming to the table is the connection. Um, that, that's the whole purpose of it, is being in deep, authentic, accountable relationship with people that we consider the other, and um, building those relationships and sustaining them. And I knew a bit about Sharon by that time, but we, you know, we're sitting around dinner, and after dinner, just the two of us, I said, what do you think about writing a book? And talked more and more, but it was, we'll think about this. By yeah, the end of the, and that was yeah. after the touchy-feely, because that was Jackson. OK, <laughs> we were in Mississippi, and it's like a, gift, a lot of people that I do not know. And I really don't like, unless it's in a work situation, I don't like spending my personal time with a lot of people I don't know. And this was like workshops about emoting <laughs> with your feelings. Well, and it's at an HBC, at, at historically and it's at black. And it's at an HBCU, yeah. which was great, which is why I wanted to be there. But it was very emotive, and I'm not an emotive kind of person like that. It, with strangers, I don't want to tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. So we kind of connected there, too, because he was like, wow, this is kind of strange. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is really strange to me. So. Yeah, and, and Sharon, when we finally had the phone call, she said, OK, if we're going to do this, we're diving in deep. I want you to meet my family. I want to meet your family. And so the first thing we did was around Thanksgiving time in 2009, 
and she flew down to stay with her cousin Renee and her family, and turns out lives in about California. in, in Southern California, yeah. lives about 20 miles from my folks. And, and so we arranged for me to live with her family for a week. And this was a three bedroom place where um, Renee and Jean, her husband, have one room, and their daughter and Sharon shared a room, and their son and daughter-in-law and two children shared a room, and I was on the couch. And I remember walking in the, the door um, at the beginning of this, and Renee, her cousin, they're Baha'i, and everything about the Baha'i is equality, everything, and at the core. And I walk in, and she just opened her arms, welcome to our home, and just embraced me. It was like, whew. And, and, then, and then there's Jean leaning against the back wall. <laughs> who, who is this white man my wife has brought into our home here? Um, but it was, it was a, and, and we spent a couple of days around my family, my sister's house, for a Thanksgiving meal, yeah. where Sharon was the only person of color. And, and so, I mean, how did that go? Well, you've read the book. <laughs> I've read it. I want to hear it from her. <laughs> <laughs> Once I got over the agony of driving down this long, ride, winding road in the middle of nowhere, we're going to an avocado farm. And for an African-American person, that is like an avocado farm. <laughs> and there's the, this, it's this lonely road, and we have to cross this creek. And I'm thinking, like, how am I going to get out of here? Because I grew up, you don't go places with strange people, especially strange white people, because you don't know what they're going to do to you. So you always have a way to leave. And this was like, I can, if something were to happen, if you haven't seen the movie Get Out, there is no way for me to get out. <laughs> But it turned out fine. I mean, they were really interesting people. I loved the, the uh, artichoke dip that his sister made. <laughs> <laughs> and I even managed to sit through some football. So it was good, between Brigham Young and the University of Utah. <laughs> the, the two of you also spent time in Bend, Oregon, which yeah. I think sure you would say is one of the whitest places in America. Yeah, uh, I statistically raised the population. <laughs> yeah. And then you also spent time going through where Sharon grew up in Chicago. Chicago. The south side of Chicago. Yeah. What did you learn from those experiences? What for, for you, going to the south side of Chicago yeah. and, and seeing her life? One of the things that Sharon just said, I think bears repeating coming out of the mouth of a white man, because it's an experience that I have never had, being concerned about what they might do to me. And knowing now the, the conversation that every mother and father has with their black sons in particular and their black daughters about how to act around white people and particularly official white people. And that alone is something that I just, I wish white people, white, those of us who think are white, would really consider, really profoundly think about that stark difference between the way that we are raised in this country. Because when I, when I talk about racism, we can all talk about it at a you know, not very deep level and get real emotional and, and what have you, but when I think of this nation and the white supremacy under which it was founded and still completely, totally operates, there's a lot of white folks that are really offended by statements like that. And I think it's, that's the, 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 the huge issue is, that's part of the truth, is you know, all the, the you know, 95% of the native peoples being wiped out and all of the people of color who are enslaved here to build this nation to benefit me. And it's just a reality. 
you know, we can get personal and take it personally and get offended and try to defend. And but I, you know, that wasn't me. That's our nation, and and so that's what I'm grateful more than anything for this experience is being in the South Side of Chicago, and being where it's mostly African American people still. And was all you know learning that Sharon, the only white people that Sharon was dealing was dealing with was the the priest and the nuns at the church and my grandmother and her grandmother. But you didn't. Think but her she family was, disowned her yeah. because she married a black man, so she never. Well, we never met her family. We didn't know anything about her background, and she was part of teaching me what you don't do, because she had been totally embraced by the black community, and on the other side, we were never embraced by them, so that also, that made a difference too. That was key, meeting the families, spending time where people grew up. Yeah. That was important to this journey. Because in understanding a person, a lot of people say, oh, I have a black friend. <laughs> and th that, that is not the answer. In order to understand how a person came to be the way they are and think what they think and live the way that they do, you really do have to experience some of their environment and the people that they came up with. And understanding, like, finding out about the rivalry between Tom and his sister. You know, and stuff like that, that really contributes to a person's personality. So it was very revealing in a lot of ways. Understanding, like, my family is Baha'i. So I actually have this very, this orientation toward not being prejudiced at all. But the way that I have to live in the world is that I have to carry myself in a certain way. The poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar put it as we wear the mask. So you have this, this self that you are with your family, and then you have the self that you are in public. I was very successful in my career working professionally. And of course, you have to be around a lot of white people. And you just learn to do things in a certain way. So we don't socialize, we do our work, and you don't ever get to see who I really am. So that was really revealing, for, I think, for both of us. Did you find you had more in common than the two of you thought you might? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we did. <laughs> she, yeah. Was, she was surprised at all the, at my musical knowledge. <laughs> really? It's like, you listen to that black group and that black group? And, you know, Southern California, we got the, ghetto, the, the, the border blast. I put on my Motown. It's like, I'm going to get in with this. <laughs> And Tom was like, yeah, have you got this one? <laughs> yeah, because I grew up with Wolfman Jack, you know, blasting across the border in Southern California. But it's, this is, I think, one of the key points is that we, in doing this, what we got to was revealing ourselves to each other in ways that we're taking off the masks. Right. And when, when, you're in each other's homes and um, or traveling around the country for a month and you're in a car for 8, 10, 12 hours a day um, and, and then at these intensely um, emotional and spiritual profound historical places, um, the masks, if you're willing, can come off and I, 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 it's, it's like now we may have issues where, you know, people are parents in this room. A lot of folks have kids, right? And sometimes we have conflicts with our kids. <laughs> well, Sharon is one of my first go-to people. I mean, we, we know each other's kids. And we're having this stuff. It's like now Sharon is just somebody I can talk to, and someone I love, and someone who is one of my best friends. And I don't say, "Oh, Sharon is my black friend," right? right. Because we broke through, and and the but it requires going through, and and some really challenging stuff with each other. I want to talk to you about that because the, the journey you went on had some, and I think particularly, Sharon, for you, some very emotional moments. Um, we go, for example, to uh, the Linden House in Rhode Island. So this is Tom's ancestor's house. This is the slave trading dynasty. Uh, it's now a museum. Um, 
being there. What went through your mind? How in the hell did these people do this? <laughs> yeah. No, I, that's... No, I mean, you look at the wealth. They had a little house in the back of the big house that was like a meditation room. And it was specifically built for that purpose. And it was obviously an expensive little accoutrement for the house. And the wealth was just obscene. And how could you know how you're making your money and feel OK with that? When you go in that little house, you what you should be meditating ab about is how you made this money off of human bodies. you know. And I, the disconnect, the cognitive dissonance that makes it possible for people to do things like that is just incredible to me. And the more, the more physical evidence you see of it, the more incredible it is. You know, so yeah, it, it was stunning. It was something that, that was, I think, uh, something that occurred during this, this trip. And uh, probably even at that museum, you see people who, who try to explain it as saying, well, that was of the times, Tom. You know, that's how people did things during the times. It wasn't right, but that's how it was during the times. When my mom watched Traces of the Trade on television, on PBS, the first thing that she said to me was, you got bleeped on national TV. <laughs> because they, when I said, you know, what we've been taught, what I've been taught in school is those were the times. Those were just as you're describing. And, but this was just after we had come back from being in the slave dungeon in uh, Cape Coast Castle. And a profound, profound experience. And um, being in a place where for hundreds of years people were held for many weeks at a time waiting for a ship to come to take them across the Middle Passage. And, and you know uh, the the floor had when they cleaned it up it was this deep in hardened dried human waste. Um, I mean it was just a horrific horrific experience. And and I said I, I when I think back that it was the times I said that's bullshit. I hope I don't get kicked out of here for that. Um, but my mother that's what she noticed. And I said. It was an evil thing, and they knew it was an evil thing, and they did it anyway. So we look at ways, and we all do this to some degree or another, rationalize behavior that we know is not the healthiest or the wisest or the kindest or the goodest for all people, but we rationalize it maybe because we're making money or because that's the way things have always been or you know the standard cliches. Are we doing things that hold up everyone, or are we not? And in this particular case, when you look at the history of this nation and the history of enslavement in this country and around the world, <coughs> people made compromises, I think soul compromises, for their comfort, for their money to and take care of their children. it was part of the public children. debate. I mean, the whole idea, the Federalists the Thomas Jefferson people versus, uh, now I'm not going to get the name straight, but the argument that went on about whether or not continuing slavery yeah. was good for a country that is destined to be, that is trying to build a democracy. So they knew this at the time, and they did all kinds of gyrations in order to rationalize it. And that makes it sometimes even worse. I mean, the Christian idea of if someone has not been saved by Jesus Christ, they're a savage, and therefore they're entitled to be enslaved. And that was the excuse that was used for Native Americans, because they don't believe in our same God, then they should be our slaves. And then by the time Africans came along, then it's a whole nother, there's this whole structure. And it's, it's frightening that people are able to do that. Have you, have you started uh, Stamped from the Beginning yet, the book? No. I just got that, and I'm partway through, and it's, it's this okay. entire history. And it's like it starts off with Cotton Mather, right. you know, biggest right. evangelist, and, and his support for and defense of slavery. And then Thomas Jefferson, who, you know, argues in the Declaration of Independence against it, and that part gets taken out, and all the while owning hundreds of people himself. Um, and so it's, it's this whole history of racism stamped from the beginning. Um, highly recommended, won the National, National Book Award last year. 
but it's it, this this whole notion is so deeply embedded in our DNA as a nation, and you know, seeing seeing having a man in Ghana tell me that slavery is a living wound in which people today are still bleeding to death. And until we remove the scab and clean the wound properly, we're never going to heal. Well, you know, and we're talking about slavery. But um, on your road trip where you went 6,000 miles, driving around the country, stopping in 21 different states, but you're stopping at places where, where Emmett Till was murdered in 1955. It's not that long ago that these sorts of things were happening in our country. And I could never go down south when I was a child because of Emmett Till, because my mother was like, oh, no, because that's, they kill, you'll, they'll kill you. Trayvon you know, so Martin. You couldn't drive at night in my lifetime mm -hmm. because you, ha you had to drive in the daylight hours because what would happen if your car broke down in the night? You never knew if you'd land in the wrong town. You know that all the towns that are named white something, like white dove, white pigeon, white plane, don't white. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. There was a book called the, Motor, the Motorist Green Book that said where black people were, would be welcomed where you knew where you could stay. You knew you couldn't go to the bathroom on the road. Once you got per, past certain uh, physical boundaries, you couldn't get food. My uncle and my mother drove out to California, and my sister is, has a, a brown skin, and they stopped at a restaurant, and they put my mother and her brother look white. My sister is brown. When they saw the baby, they put her, they told her, no, no, we can't, you have to get your food out around back. And this is in my lifetime. So yes, it is within, mem within memory, which makes it worse. Having a living person when I was a child who was enslaved, that is amazing to me because it is living. It is. It does continue. And we'll, we'll talk in more specifics this afternoon about the present day impact of all this. Of, I mean, it, name a social indicator you want to study whether it's access to health care or health results, lifespan, low birth weight babies, education, housing, um, wealth, you name it, it's better to be white in this country. And that's all part of the legacy. When, when you look at the, the GI Bill um, coming out of World War II, wanting to support our veterans coming home, 98% of that money went to white veterans. It built the suburbs. All the property taxes that pay for our schools, all the property taxes were going to the suburbs. So who's got the better schools? What happens to the inner city schools? I mean, the, the, all of this stuff ripples out, and it's all explainable. It's all understandable if we really pay attention to our history as a nation. And I think that's what we, we so often don't know. I mean, I grew up in Pomona, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. I didn't know until two months ago when I went to a talk by a woman, Japanese woman, who was interred during World War II, that the city I grew up in had a place where, where people would go initially and then be dispersed to one of the camps. It's now the LA County Fairgrounds. They never taught that in my schools growing up, let alone the truth about the history of enslavement in this nation and what it means for all of us today as Americans, as men and women, people of color, people of white, European background. How do we build um, the kinds of connections that the two of you found over time? Uh, your story is a remarkable story, but how do we do that on a, a larger scale? How, how do we make um, make the country have a better understanding of its past and what that means about the present. Don't let Texas write the text for No, that, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say for everybody else, but I have found my way through genealogy because the concept for coming to the table is that we have linked descendants. 
So the ideal situation is that you have someone, you are the descendant of people who own slaves, and you are the descendant of the people that your family enslaved. And that means that you can connect in a really visceral way across the historical panorama. And so through genealogy, we are able to do that. I help black people because we, need, we want to find out who we are because we weren't in human records until 1870. We were in property records. So we don't know who we're related to as other black people, much less who we might be connected to because of slavery. And in my example, the book I'll be writing in Mississippi is that my ancestress had 17 children with the nephew of her owner. And I have traced all of those children and I have found their descendants today, some of whom live as white people and had no idea there's a black person in there, and some of whom have always lived as black. Growing up in Chicago, I knew we knew of some of them, but they live as white people, so we never visited them, we never talked to them, we never had anything to do with them. But as I've come together with the descendants now, it's like, wow, our whole picture is coming together. And it has been a very healing activity, and it takes it past just my personal experience into something bigger for others. Tom, l let me ask you a, a question speaking for, for white folks. Um, oh, yeah, that's me, the representative that's, that's of right. all white you folks. <laughs> for today's purposes, okay, you're, the guy. you're the guy. I frequently do that. Too. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, but you, I think you said this in the book. I mean, there, a lot of us feel uncomfortable, don't know what to say, think we might say the wrong thing, that there are people who shy away from frank conversations about race. Um, how do you change that? It's an uncomfortable conversation for many white people. Yes, it is. And you say not so much for, for black people. Black people talk about We talk about, about it all the time. But, and, 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 but we've also encountered plenty of black folks who don't want to talk. Yeah. There's, and there's different reasons that different people don't want to talk about this. For some, it's fear of, oh, I don't want to deal with being a bad person. And for others, maybe it's, you know, I just don't want to be talk about being related to people who were enslaved for a variety of reasons. But the, the I'll tell you, I'll cut right to the chase that the benefits of the conversation is it's liberating. This is our liberation. This is the way, this is the road to, to freedom and the release of burden is being honest about who I am and what my wounds are and what needs healing within me. And make no mistake, we have inherited this history in our DNA. Do just the briefest study of epigenetics and you understand um, how things, the, the triggers on our DNA get passed down and, and the things that were traumatizing to generations ago of people are passed down in our DNA. This is not just a social construct. Um, these wounds are very real. And the, the, the way that the coming to the table approach works is setting up an actual space where intentionally we're going to talk about difficult topics. And we're going to make some agreements on how we're going to treat each other in this conversation right off the bat in, in respect. Um, maybe it's going to include confidentiality. It's recognizing we're not going to cure 400 years of history in this two hours we're going to spend on a Saturday afternoon, but we're going to take steps and we're going to agree to meet next month and the next month and the next month and continue this conversation. We're going to meet in circle where we equalize the space, where I'm not in charge telling everybody what to think. Um, I was raised... Protestant. I hope that doesn't get me kicked out of here, too. Um, but there's not going to be a priest or a minister running the show, or a professor, or a doctor. There's going to be a talking piece, and who has that talking piece is in charge for that period of time. And it equalizes the room. For the restorative justice. And case. we're going to talk about restore, restoring justice. We're going we're gonna to deal with trauma <laughs> and understanding that. And it takes time. It takes, it's like... Anything in life that's worth doing, raising your children well, getting an education, it takes time and it takes commitment. And, and so there are good models out there for having these conversations. And, and you know, there's coming to the table 
but then they're staying at the table when it gets hard. And I'm, I'm so glad to see lots of white men here. I sort of feel like that's my, my main audience. White men are not typically the best readers and not typically showing up at a lot of these conversations, um, but the face of power and oppression in this country since the beginning is this face. We have a lot of work to do in the healing with women, with people of color, with young people, class issues. So, Sharon, I think you said, uh, unless you wanted to add something. I was going to say that I think that one of the things that we try to do, or not try to do, one of the things that is obvious about us is that we represent a model. We are two normal people. We are not academics. We are not clergy. We are not, we don't have any, um, status-oriented thing <clears throat> that says that, that we should be doing this. We're just two normal people. And if we can do this and come, come together across the, the wide geography that separates us, the black and white, the male, female, if we can overcome all of those opposing things and end up here with this level of understanding and this amount of peace in our lives, then anybody can do it. So I think that's what, that's what we hope to portray to you, and that's, you'll see that as these next two days evolve. I was going to say, in, in this book, one of the great things about the book is that you, both Sharon and Tom at times write. It's in their voice, so you're reading their words. And I remember your words, you, you going into this, Sharon, I think you were wary of, of how this might turn out, <laughs> how it might turn out. But at the end of the book, you said um, the thing that was that you took away from it is the changes that occurred in you were small personal right. changes. What are you talking about? Well, when I first took off my mask, I threatened to kill Tom. <laughs> and I got way past that, and now I embrace him as my friend. That's a very big thing, but it is, a, it is also a very small thing, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to, uh, to just be more open-hearted about people, to be more expressive, to, um, to be less guarded about things about myself because that's part of how, how you're not helping someone when you do that. It's like when you have a conversation with a white person and they say something that's really stupid and you just, <laughs> and you just don't deal with it. <laughs> and instead, I can actually say, well, wait a minute. Have you thought about this? Or, you know, like engage conversation. Or, you know, just be more compassionate or understanding or communicative. And all those little small things added up into a person. I think I'm a much better person. So. Tom, you wrote in here that I, I think, and I was surprised by this. That I think you said at one point that, and this was written again, this is published back in 2012. I think you said something that you were a little more pessimistic about things. You love her. and value this experience, but generally speaking, you were a little bit more pessimistic. Here we are in 2018. How do you feel about things today? How does everybody here feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and this is, this is the, the interesting thing is, is, yeah, in the writing of this book, because of everything I learned about myself, myself, which is really a key piece, is know myself. Each of you know yourself. And what I learned about my nation, about the state of Oregon, about the town I live in, about my family, about my friends. Um, it's, you know so much more about the woundedness. And, and it was just, it was deeply sad. And I, I've, I've come back a little from that. And in fact, in this day and age, this year, um, there's a lot to be concerned about in this nation. And I would say that there is a pretty decent degree of gratitude that I feel for the president, for the president, I will say, and for the present political situation in that, as Professor Anyudoho said, until we remove the scabs and clean the wound properly. I can't remember a time in my lifetime where I was so aware of the wounds. They're open wide for everybody to see. So we have an opportunity now that 
that it's, it's really hard to hide at this point in time. And the divisions are stark. And people are entrenched in our beliefs. Whatever they may be, we are stronger now in our beliefs. And like we were talking a little bit earlier when we were alone with the social media, it's easy to get into a tribe now that supports your beliefs. It's, boy, ready-made. I can tell, anyone can tell what your beliefs in general are, depending on the channels you talk about on television. <laughs> or what Twitter feeds you follow, or Facebook groups that you're in. So it's, there's where I... I One thing uh, we try to do is to, it's like we're on this seesaw. So sometimes Tom is the more optimistic. And then sometimes I'm the more optimistic. As long as we don't end up being totally pessimistic all at the same time, it's like the there's The teeter-totter's hope. broke. The teeter-totter's <laughs> broke. <laughs> Sounds like you're good for each other, you know, at, at different points. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you're seated in the seating section down below, we have new microphones. You'll see on these microphones, they say push. That means push, keep your finger down on the button, and we'll all be able to hear your question. If you're in the back, if you just hang on, Steve will come over with a microphone, and you can ask your question back there. So feel free to raise your hand, and we'll take a few questions for Tom and Sharon. Yes? I keep it down the whole yeah, time. Yeah, keep it down the whole time, yeah. I watched Traces of the Trade three times, and I found your personal transformation to be probably the most moving part of it for me. But I'm wondering, what is your cousin Katrina Brown up to, and does she collaborate with you on, on this project you're involved in now? Katrina lives in Washington, D.C. now, and she was at the last national gathering for coming to the table and did some... Um, I forget what the exercise was called. The body movement mind yeah. thing. I mean, part of the healing process is what, whatever works in cleaning and healing the wounds is valuable. And, and so she was doing this. And it's an expression of movement and dance. Um, and we're not in constant contact, but we are in contact. And particularly recently, this month is the 10th anniversary of Traces of the Trade premiering at Sundance. And so we all got an email from Katrina. She said, at this exact moment, we were sitting in a dark theater in freezing cold Park City, Utah. It was similar to today <laughs> in Milwaukee. Um, so, I mean, she remains very committed to this work and involved, um, you know, in various people. It's the 10 of us, it's like any family. There's people you really um, enjoy. And stay. I mean, Elizabeth, her son is my godson. I see them multiple times a year. And there's others, like we all have members of our family that we may not want to have Thanksgiving with. Um, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, uh, hang on one second. We'll bring a microphone over for you. <clears throat> Has the, the de Young dynasty begun reparations with de Wolf. generation? De Wolf, excuse me, the de Wolf dynasty made reparations or have some kind of big project underway? There are so many thousands of people descended from the, the, the three generations of people that are descended. I, I get that question a fair amount, and um, I don't know how to answer it. Um, there are people who um, have made wonderful contributions financially um, to important causes in this regard. And I always cut back to what are you doing to repair the damage? And to, to each of us in this room, what are we doing to repair the damage? Um, right now, on, I've got a stack of bookmarks that has the Coming to the Table website on it for anybody who's interested. There's a, just published this month is a reparations guide um, on the Coming to the Table website that's been developed over the last three years and different ways individually and collectively um, actions that we can take 
to make a difference. Um, you know, for a lot of people, the concept of reparations is, um, to a lot of white people, reparations sounds like somebody who was never owned anybody paying money to somebody who was never owned. And so I don't want anything to do with that. Um, but when we look in our hearts at this wound, in every wound, there's a need for repair. And so how can we, how can we take steps towards that repair? It could mean a lot of things. Um, it certainly means <laughs> fixing the disparities in education um, that, that are faced in this nation. It's certainly repairing the education level, the knowledge level of police around this nation. Yesterday would have been Trayvon Martin's 23rd birthday. So part of the repair is how are we educating police officers in this nation so that we don't have this huge disparity in the deaths of young black men, unarmed young black men in this country. Um, I know that that may not be the, the answer that you were looking for, and, and that's fine. And, I'm, and I'm, my request to you and to everyone is to look at what am I doing for repair. I could tell you how much money um, my wife and I donate to nonprofit organizations, and that may be an answer that you're looking for, and I'm not going to do that today. Well, um, I think one part of the repair, we wrote this book. Yeah. That helped repair me in a lot of ways. Yeah. And that had nothing to do with money. Now, for the rest of you, give me your address, and I will come and pick up my check. <laughs> <laughs> I take other questions. Yes. Just hold your finger down on that button. Thank you. So as you two were getting to know each other, did you find that you had things in common? I mean, you obviously had things that were that desperately we not in common. But as you were coming to get to know each other, did you discover that, wow, we, we really do have things in common? Things in common. We also did a, we had a friend help us do a family chart because people kept asking us if we found out that we're related, like genetically. Mm -hmm. And we found that there is a connection. Tom is related to the white people in my family. So we'd be like 99th cousins to the 10th <laughs> removed or something. So it's really circuitous. So that's, that's one. The answer to your question, though, is that, yes, we have found things in common. And interestingly, I think early on I found <clears throat> having a lot more in common with his wife. Like there were a lot of questions about, whoa, he's on the road with you all the time. It's like, hmm, what's going on? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Lindy was like, when are you and Tom going on the road again? Because <laughs> I really want to play some tennis. <laughs> and we, so we learned in meeting her, learned we both crochet, we do these creative stuff. She taught me how to play mahjong, you know, so we, we both like games. And that helped also as a window into Tom because understanding the person that he is, has chosen for his life mate gives you a lot of insight on his personality. When he met my son, he got a lot of insight on who I am because he sees the person that I raised. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff that we found in common, but a lot of stuff that wasn't. And when our kids would come to our a presentation right. like this, it was, a, it was a really big deal when they could see the two of us and see us in ways that they hadn't imagined mom or dad before. And talking with her son and his wife afterwards, um, when, when, in, uh, when we were at the Quaker York. Meeting yeah. House in New York, and um, they both expressed, this was really good to see. This is a, this is a side that I just hadn't seen before. Um, so, and who, what human being on this planet are you going to be with and devote time to that you're not gonna find things in common? I mean, we all wanna be happy. We all want our children to be happy. We wanna be successful. We wanna be healthy. We wanna be, you know, there's a huge list. It's really 5% of the crap that we're all divided on. We all have a great deal in common in our, in our desire for love and acceptance and, and nurturing and health. And we fight about 
Religion, politics, sex. Money. Yeah. There's something else you have in common. You sound a bit like a preacher there where you're speaking. <laughs> and you thought about being a minister, and you thought about being a nun. About being a nun. <laughs> <laughs> so see, something else in common that the two of you have. <laughs> Maybe take one or two more questions. Yes, please. Hang on, we'll get uh, Steve will get the microphone for you. I mean that in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Um, I guess my question is, what do you think I can do to repair justice as a Hispanic, light-skinned, queer female who doesn't get acknowledged a lot in America? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's one of the issues that does come up, coming to the table, being focused on the, the legacy of enslavement in this country. It's, you know, the, the focus is naturally all the time on enslavers and the enslaved black and white people. And so people of um, Asian descent, Hispanic descent, um, um, you know, how do we fit into this? And at the core, it's understanding trauma and the impact that trauma has on us and how to be resilient in the face of trauma and how to do that together with other people. I am so sad at what's going on in immigration policy in this country right now, what's happening in the, the, the forced breakup of families in this country right now that is largely falling on people of Hispanic descent. Um, I'm, I'm so sad what's happening with the condemnation of all Muslim people in this nation. Um, it's that, you know, part of the work that is, is recognizing our own privilege, and I think there's a lot of disparity in this room for levels of privilege. One thing everyone in this room shares today is we're sitting in a really nice, warm room and we have food and clean water. We're in the top 5% in this world sitting in this room. So like Sharon said, you know, writing this book was a, was a big piece for us in trying to make a difference. You'll find yours. You're already doing a lot and you know you are. And taking more steps to find your place in this world to make that positive difference, to use whatever privileges each of us has to create the kind of world that we know, that we imagine, that our hearts believe is possible. Would you like a final word? Yeah, I'll continue by saying that if we don't do that, we are going to end, our society is in such, such a state of disrepair. There are so many things that need to be fixed about it. And I think that every, each and every person in this room has the ability to make a change somewhere, starting with yourself and then in whatever small sphere of influence in which you are involved. We have to remember that as, as the society continues to, I'll have to say, devolve in the way that it is, First, something will happen to someone, and just like it happened in Nazi Germany. So first they came for the gypsies, then they came for the homosexuals, and finally they came for the Jews and they killed them. And eventually, had it gone on, the next thing, they'll come for you, and who's going to defend you? So I keep that in my head, because you have to stand where you are and do what you can about whatever it is. You choose your space, the area that you're going to fight for, because if you don't do it, Eventually, it's going to come back and hurt you. White society is beginning to understand that black kids are no longer the only ones that are getting killed in the street. Now anybody can be assaulted because the police have been so militarized. So it's things like that that we have to stop, these trends in our society. I am going to wrap things up there. Before we go, um, a couple of things. Our next event is Thursday. We'll have... Uh, what I guess you can call an exit interview with retiring Milwaukee Police Chief Ed Flynn. He'll be done on February 16th. He'll be here for the hour. Uh, next week um, on Thursday, and I think that's sold out too, um, we will have 
Mark Hogan, who is the Secretary of Wisconsin's Economic Development Corporation, will be talking about the Foxconn deal. And um, again, I, I say they're sold out, but you can watch them. Our, our events are being live streamed. You can uh, see them uh, anytime, watch them live if you can't be here in This person. was live? Absolutely. Absolutely. You just now told us that. <laughs> Sorry, Mom, I got bleeped again. <laughs> Yeah, we'll go back and fix that. So. Okay, good. <laughs> but anyhow, before we go today, uh, I say this at the end of all our events, and I mean it very sincerely. We appreciate your interest, your attention, and, and the willingness to be here and to listen to our guests uh, in such a respectful manner. And uh, most of all, we want to thank our guests today, uh, Sharon uh, Morgan and Tom DeWolf, who are spending a couple of days with us here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was painless. That